we have Stephen Lucia, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Forevermark, the De Beers Group of Companies Diamond Brand. He is also Executive Vice President of Marketing at the De Beers Group. You'll find in your conference pack the rest of his bio. Stephen has kindly agreed to talk about the role of, down, of the downstream in Botswana's development story. So I'm very grateful for Stephen to kick us off this morning to talk about that. Just a reminder again that this meeting today is on the record, so it's not under the Chatham House rule. Stephen, if you'd like to give us your thoughts, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. I wonder if that warning about being on the record is because uh, I've got a history of uh, 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 controversial statements, but I'll try to be well behaved this morning. Um, as Alex said, I, I've spent uh, my career uh, really in the diamond business, but in a particular part of that diamond business. And um, over the last 30 years, I really focused on what is it that makes consumers around the world desire and cherish this fantastic product, the diamond, and what do we need to do to, to make sure that as we look forward to the future, they continue to do so. And, um, and it's been a fascinating journey that's taken me to countries all over the world. Uh, and I guess the one thing that I've learned in talking to consumers, you know, from as far away as, as uh, Boston or Beijing or Mumbai, uh, is that they cherish it for very similar reasons. It's a, it's an, it's a symbol in their culture, it's a symbol of commitment, of love. It's a simple a symbol of success. And I think it's a symbol of permanence and we shorthand forever. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got there uh, over the years and I wanted to talk a little bit more about, uh, about what some of the challenges and opportunities that we see looking out into the future. And of course, you know, I'm probably pretty biased um, coming from the marketing side uh, uh, of the De Beers Group and of this partnership. But I, I think I would argue that perhaps uh, the, the long-term marketing efforts that De Beers has carried out around the world for diamonds is perhaps the most undervalued and perhaps one of the most important elements of what has made this partnership so successful and so long-lasting. And I think, let's just start with a simple concept that it, at De Beers we think about. We say that all value in the diamond business is based upon the consumer's desire for our product. And we talk a lot about how value addition is made through the channel, and we talk a lot about the inherent value of our product, but fundamentally, it is what the consumer believes it to be. That is where the value comes from. And if they're not interested in buying our product, or if they don't think it's worth the money, then it won't be. It's really fundamentally that, that simple. And when you compare our products, uh, the diamond to other products, you can see a little bit why. You know, even if we think about products that are maybe in a similar world to us, take gold or take platinum, less than half of gold is used in jewelry. Platinum, it's only about a third of platinum is used in jewelry. The rest used in industrial applications. When it comes to diamonds and the value of diamonds, it's all in the world of diamond jewelry. We're a luxury gem. And because of that, we don't, um, I, I always struggle quite slightly with the word. I say, sometimes I say we have no functional purpose or no rational purpose, but I don't really like the word rational because I think it underplays the importance of emotion. But it's true that we don't provide a functional benefit in the same way that many other, uh, certainly almost all other mind products do. You know, you can't uh, heat your home, at least not yet, with a diamond. You can't travel from A to B with a diamond like you can in a car, even a you know, whether it's a luxury car or a normal car, it still gets you from A to B. It gives you a rationalization for that. With diamonds, we don't do that. We're all about emotion. 
Now, I would argue uh, that actually that's a more important human need to fulfill than a rational need. Because if you're trying to get from point A to B, there might be a better way. Uh, you know, when there were horses and carriages that took you from A to B, they sort of disappeared because there was a better way to get from A to B in a car. When it comes to emotional needs, these are long-standing human, fundamental human things. They don't change over time. So that's actually a powerful position. The task is to make sure that your product can speak powerfully for those human needs. So I would argue that there's a fundamental human need, for example, for a man to express love and emotion uh, uh, to those that he loves. I think it's fundamental. The task for us in the diamond industry 50 years ago or 60 years ago when it started, uh, the marketing effort, and, and even today, is to make sure that our product is the one with the voice that can, can symbolize and represent that need. And if we do, I think we're more powerful than products which just provide uh, a functional benefit and are capable of being substituted. So we're based on, our, our whole desire demand is really based on an individual and then a culture's appreciation of what a diamond represents, both personally and in that culture. And it's very powerful, but you can't not take it for granted. In the same way that functional products can be replaced by things which perform better, there are also others looking to occupy this powerful space of being symbols uh, of love and symbols of commitment. And we uh, are determined uh, that they won't succeed in that task. This is our space for diamonds, and we are determined uh, to own it long into the future. But let's spend a few minutes maybe just looking back on how, how do we get from uh, uh, sort of 1940s when diamonds weren't that symbol around the world to, to today. And I guess it's good to start by, by thinking, you know, diamonds have always, well before De Beers, been a precious product. If you look back hundreds of years ago, um, the days when then diamonds largely came from, from uh, India, uh, they were something that were cherished but they were cherished for different reasons, really two fundamental reasons. One was the, their inherent hardness. The fact that they were a material unlike others made them different and special. So you found in the early days, particularly the Maha, uh, Maharajas and other uh, warrior princes of Europe would wear them as talismans. The idea that it protects them, uh, symbol, a, a symbol of protecting them in, in battle and protecting, in many cases, their reign. And then, I guess in addition to hardness, was their extraordinary rarity. At that time, they were so rare that really only the world's wealthiest, uh, forget the wealthiest 1%, we're talking about the wealthiest 1% of 1%, uh, could acquire them. So they took on a status uh, appeal as well. And those were the drivers for, for a very long time. The challenge to that became what we, we, we found really in the turn of the century was the, uh, the discoveries of diamond mines in South Africa. And diamonds uh, went from, I guess, extraordinary rarity to pretty rare. There were greater volumes of diamonds. And that required the, the product to be you know, we use the word democratize, it's not quite right, but we needed to expand the universe of demand from those, those collectors at the, at the pinnacle of, of wealth uh, to the wor world's more growingly affluent populations. And that took a different idea. And one has to credit, you know, I've been here a long time, but I, I wasn't here back in the 1940s, so I can't take personal credit for the... Uh, for the concept, but we have to credit those who came before me uh, in designing the idea of attaching diamonds to this, to this fundamental human need of love and commitment. And it does go back to the 1940s, led by, at that time, Harry Oppenheimer, who was the, the sort of visionary behind the, uh, the concept, who went to America, hired an ad agency, NWR, uh, and created the iconic campaign, A Diamond is Forever. And what did that campaign do? 
You know, it didn't succeed by accident. Some people sometimes say, oh, it's like a marketing thing, these diamonds. No, no. They actually, the diamonds themselves had to be precious in the first place. Otherwise, they could never represent what was then life's most precious moment, your engagement. The two things go together. You couldn't have a product which was which people would look at and think, oh, you know, that's not very special. It can't represent something special. But the, the trick was, was uh, the brilliance was taking this idea of we've got this extraordinarily special product, and if we can link it with this extraordinarily special moment, which is celebrated not just by the wealthiest, but by everyone in the population. At that time, the wedding ring, the, the diamond engagement ring, a symbol of marriage. If we can combine those things, we could give dime, we could we could supercharge the way in which diamonds are perceived in the world and expand demand quite significantly. And you know, in many ways that's history. De Beers invested year after year from the 1940s in this concept of diamonds as the ultimate symbol of love and commitment. It built that tradition in America. From when they started in the 1940s, less than 10% of people would get a diamond when they got married to 90% today. And then interestingly, they looked beyond America, and I guess that's, uh, we're now beginning to get to the early days of, of, of my time with De Beers, when we recognized, particularly with a new production coming from Botswana, which was again going to be a game changer in terms of increasing the supply of diamonds to the world, that we needed to go to new places to find new customers in order to make sure that that demand was smoothly absorbed into the world uh, picture. And we went to Japan first in the 1960s. We went to uh, China uh, in the uh, late, uh, early 1990s. And then we went, I don't know what you call the noughties, I guess. We went to India in the decade after that to develop these new markets which we need both then and for the future to make sure that there is a consumer for every diamond uh, that is mined uh, around the world. And China was fascinating. We went there in 1991. I remember going from Beijing to, um, flew into Beijing uh, airport, going into town. You know, it's not like China now, huh? and it's not that long ago. I was the only car on the, on the road going in. They were building the motorway, building it by ox, not by machine. I got to Beijing, there were no stores, no jewelry stores, no diamonds, no one knew what a diamond was. We did some consumer research and, um, and they told me, uh, the consumer said, oh, I know two things about diamonds. I know that, um, that uh, they're the hardest substance known to man because they taught me that in my science class and they're used in industry. And they told me that, uh, that the seven dwarfs, something I had forgotten as a boy, that the seven dwarfs in Snow White were actually diamond miners. And when they went to whistle while they work, they were on their way to get diamonds. Uh, uh, with a pickaxe, I think, if I remember from memory. So we started from literally zero. I almost thought, what am I doing here in Beijing? Uh, I'd read The Economist. It said it was booming. I got there. It didn't feel like it was booming. Uh, but we thought, well, let's take the long-term view. And we invested that very next year in national tele television advertising. And 20 years on, it's the second largest market in the world and a key driver uh, of demand. And we were there first which gave us a very strong position in the luxury goods world. So, you know, that's the history, and the history is useful because it got you a foundation and it gets you to where you are today, but by no means is the history gonna help you looking forward. You know, it's now done, I'm afraid, and you need to, to think about what the challenges are we have in the future. And the consumer world is changing. It's a very different place than it was uh, when I started 30 years ago. China and India now are very important in the, what their consumers think about diamonds now and in the future. Despite the, you know, we read about the economic challenges in China, those consumers will be there and they'll be there for the decades to come. And uh, we need to make sure our product is perfectly positioned compared to the luxury alternatives that they have. And the millennials in America even, we take America for granted. The millennial generation is very different from their parents. I mean, let me just give you a few things that make them different, that affect us, as the, I think, in the diamond sector. Digital is everything to them. 
the way in which they live their world is through a digital existence. This is changing the rules of marketing. How, you, how do you put your story across to a generation that doesn't watch a TV program that hasn't been recorded and the ads zapped? Uh, they don't watch them. They don't read magazines. They don't read newspapers. They don't even believe what companies or governments uh, tell them. They listen to celebrities. They think they're the source of truth. But uh, authority is different than what it was. How do we reach them? It's entirely different marketing strategy in a world of, uh, of social uh, media, in a world of friends recommending, which become more important than you as a company advising. We need to find a way to master this digital world if we're going to keep the millennials. And it's, and it's new, it's different, we need new skills, new capabilities, and we're in the process of building those. But you know, the digital world changes more than that. And it changes what is status. You know, the generation before, status was, was a, definitely a possession that you wore. And you showed people when you were together. T status today is what is on your uh, Instagram. And if you notice yourself, you go to a concert today with a lot of young people. How many people are watching the concert? How many people are watching the concert through their phone? They hold their phone up and they're watching the thing through their phone. Then they turn around and they do it that way, with them in it. Why? Because they're creating a status experience. Because when they post that, they're showing people, aren't they cool? Because they are here. And their life through experiences is now more interesting than their life through possessions. This is a challenge for the luxury goods industry, and it's a challenge for us. Because we're a possession. We're not an experience, some say. I think the challenge is to focus again on the experience of owning, wearing, giving diamonds. And we need to turn that into an experience that can be shared through this digital world. Just one example of how the marketing world for us is changing. What else about millennials? Millennials are very focused on, millennials are very focused on responsible sourcing, compassionate consumption. They want to know, particularly I think when it comes to diamonds, something that they're going to wear next to their finger, they're going to wear their whole life, it's going to symbolize their hopes, their dreams, their positive. They don't want any issue about that magical thing that's going to take away from that joy. Ten years ago, they probably didn't think there was any way to know. Now they're demanding answers. So we need to find a way to make sure we, we can deliver what they want. They're the kings here, not us. They, we need to respond to them. It's extraordinarily important in this concept. So what do we do with this new group of, of consumers? What do we do with with these millennials in America? What do we do with these new Chinese consumers uh, who are different from the Americans as well, the generation before? Interestingly, they're more similar to the millennial Americans than they are to their, their Chinese parents. It's an interesting phenomenon. The young are more similar than the generation globally than the generations up and down within country. And we think that the answer to this is going to be a different marketing tool. It's going to be a marketing tool based around brand. And brands can do a lot of things for us that historically we would do on a category basis. But brands are more interesting to these millennials, particularly in China, but also in America, because they can tell a better story. They can tell a story about their brand that connects better with millennials than simply talking about products. And so De Beers has really focused its efforts around this concept of building this new marketing tool for, the, for, for the, in effect, the benefit of its minds around the world so it provides a distribution channel, a preferred distribution channel for consumers of the decades to come. Brands, though, aren't easy. Um, they need scale. It's not easy to big scale. You can't really be a tiny little brand because nobody knows you and then you're not a brand. And we've made a few mistakes along the way building brands that were too small. We need scale. 
Forever Mark is the brand, is the principal marketing tool of De Beers. Uh, it's my role as CEO of Forever Mark, and we're in the process of building this scale, powerful distribution channel. We're about five years old, but we're already in about 1,750 retail doors in 36 countries around the world. We'd like to think all the best jewelers uh, uh, are either with us or we'll get, them, uh, we'll get them soon. That scale is important because scale gives you two things. It gives you the ability to have the expertise you need, and you can't build brands with, with uh, small teams in one place. Huh? I've got teams in China, I've got team of Chinese in China, Americans in America, Indians in India, Japanese in Japan, working in those countries with the retailers, with the consumers, building this brand from, from the bottom up. And I've got experts on the diamond side who do the extraordinarily important task of, I'm gonna call it selecting diamonds that meet the quality criteria, but really what they do is reject those that don't. Uh, because you need to make sure you're living up to your consumer promise. And I think the, the other th good things about brands, or the other thing you need, of course, is you need awareness. Uh, if nobody knows who you are, uh, and that takes literally hundreds of billions of dollars invested continually over time. There's no cheap way, uh, I'm afraid, to do it. It's a big cost, but the prize at the end is strong consumer awareness. People know who you are. Uh, they know what you stand for, and they develop a preference for your product. And importantly, as a result of that, they recognize that it's worth more, and they're willing to pay more for the value that they see. It's a very important part of, uh, of brand building. But I think the other two reasons why brands are so important now are two other issues we're seeing in our environment. The one I talked about before, which was about responsible sourcing. Um, brands are a fantastic way to deliver that promise to a consumer because the brands can look after their distribution channel from the mine all the way to the consumer's finger and provide that uh, assurance that consumers need and I think will increasingly demand uh, from all of us. Uh, and secondly, in a world where consumers are getting increasingly concerned about whether their product is authentic, you know, is it the real thing? Is it a fake? Is it a synthetic? Has it been treated some way so it's not as valuable as it should be? It's in effect misrepresenting itself as something that it's not. In that world, for particularly for gems and particularly for diamonds, I think you need the ultimate assurance. Consumers are demanding that they want to know that the money they're spending, they're getting the real thing that they think they are as at the quality that we say it is. And providing that assurance is something that I think brands can do better than uh, the way in which the, his, uh, or the history of the industry has treated it before. Because a brand lives or dies on its reputation. That's all it has. If it says that this is a diamond and it's this quality and it isn't, the brand is the one who suffer. So we have everything to lose by getting it wrong and as a result, everything to gain by getting it right and we take responsibility. And I think that that resonates with the consumer they feel the benefit and the power and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the positive feeling that that gives them. So, let me bring it where I started. I, I talked about why I thought that this was, brand was powerful for, uh, for the future. I think it's also powerful for the partnership uh, between De Beers uh, and Botswana because I think our priorities are very similar. We both, did, we both got the goal of maximizing the value of every diamond that gets mined uh, in this country. That's Forever Mark's focus. We want to make sure that we can bring as much value through that channel uh, as possible and that the consumer recognizes that value and is prepared to pay for it. Not everybody in the distribution channel shares the desire of maximizing the value of the product, particularly, I should say, many of our retail partners where if they can get it cheaper, that sounds like a good idea. If they can undercut and price their competitor by getting a cheaper source, they quite like that idea. We're not really interested in that. We're trying to maximize the value, and I think uh, our partners in government have the same feeling. They want to maximize the value of that resource in the ground. I think that Forevermark as well, when we think a about 
beneficiation here in Botswana, what does Forevermark do? Once we build this scale, it provides a sort of ready-made channel, a ready-made distribution channel that can take the diamonds that are cut and polished here straight into, through Forevermark, straight to the best retailers all over the world without being dependent on any single individual retailer, which is also important in maximizing the value of the product. And if we can drive premium pricing for Forevermark, it provides a greater competitive opportunity for those building their manufacturing capability uh, today in, in Botswana, competing against very cost-effective players in places like India, uh, who do have a cost advantage, but we think we can potentially have a quality advantage uh, here, here in Botswana through the Forevermark distribution channel. It addresses directly the ethical concerns. In fact, the benefits the diamonds create, that the government creates here in Botswana using the resources uh, that they get from the diamond industry, I'm sure you heard lots about this yesterday, but that's an important part of what Forevermark promises to the consumer. You know, we're, we're linked and aligned in this mission. Consumers want to feel good about the diamonds that they buy. They don't want to just know that they didn't do any harm. That's not enough. They want to know that their diamonds actually proactively improved the environment where those diamonds came from. So we can take the good work that's done here in, uh, by the government in Botswana and we can build that into the messages through the brand that we tell the consumer, which makes them desire both the diamonds and actually makes them positive toward, uh, toward Botswana. And we can use it as a tool uh, to keep comp consumer confidence high. So I think it's an exciting, it's an exciting time. It's been a great long-term uh, benefit to the partnership, our marketing, but I think it could be even more exciting uh, in the future. And sometimes when I'm feeling particularly creative, I think, ah, is there even opportunities to link this to some other of the government's goals? I think a lot about ecotourism, for example. Is there a connection between the way in which the Forevermark brand can be marketed? Let's go all the way back to think about digital experiences. Huh? How can we connect consumers who buy Forevermark with the experience of what happens in Botswana? Maybe bring them here, create an event, get it on their Instagram, uh, and then millions of people around the world see the experience. I think there's a direct connection between responsible sourcing of diamonds you know, and, and protecting the rhinos here in Botswana. I think there are real opportunities. So that's my challenge for, uh, for the next couple of years. Thanks very much. I hope I didn't take too much uh, of your time, left a little time for Q&A, but I uh, appreciate uh, you all being here so early in the morning to, um, uh, to hear me talk about something that I'm so passionate about, uh, uh, the dream that is diamonds. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Stephen. We do have um, time for just a couple of questions. And so, do anybody have questions? Let's take a, a couple of questions. The gentleman just here, there's a microphone just coming straight to you. Please do remind us who you yes. are. Yes, my name is Mapazi. I read a few months ago that um, you introduced laser engraving for forever mark uh, in, in India, in Surat, or, or, or I think it's Surat, one of those. We see it because um, even with aggregation in Botswana, uh, we still have a, a larger chunk of our diamonds, of diamonds living in Botswana uh, unprocessed. Yeah. Let's I, just, just hold. Actually, we'll get another question if yeah. there's any more. Any more questions? Please, sir. Sorry, sir, because we're live streaming, if you can just say who you are so the people who are watching oh. us can, bon the bon bon can watch you. Bon yeah. bon 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 you made just a passing reference to synthetics. Is there a message in that? And the message that uh, the millennials and their ethical considerations, the brands that we are talking about, that they, there is no threat to the product you have been talking about. Thank you very much. A final question at all? No? Yes. Hi, I'm Maria De Silva. 
formerly employed at the Chamber of Mines in South Africa. Um, given the growing concerns of doing no harm and, in fact, improving you know, the environment where it comes from, the whole issue of mining and you know, environmental degradation that follows, um, that is becoming a huge concern. So how does De Beers address that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Up. Oh, okay. Uh, Liza Mambai, I'm with De Beers. I wanted to ask to what extent does Forever Mark see Africa as a collective, as a market for diamonds? Good. I think that's four questions. So, Stephen. Okay. Thank you very much. All very, actually, very insightful and interesting questions. Um, the first question was around uh, the grading facility that uh, Forever Mark has opened up in Surat. And um, I guess uh, I imagine uh, the sort of unstated but follow on question is you know, when in, in uh, Gaborone? But um, we did open a facility in Surat last year, and I guess it really it relates directly to where we are in the uh, model of building Forever Mark. That, um, we started Forever Mark in China, which was our largest market, uh, and still today is, uh, is extraordinarily important to Forever Mark. The consumers in China, though, tend to buy uh, smaller diamonds. And um, uh, so we have a large volume of very small diamonds going through the Forever Mark program, which are uh, almost entirely cut and polished in Surat uh, in India. So it makes great sense to locate the grading facility next, right next to the place where those diamonds are cut and polished. Uh, and that's why we put this low cost, uh, high volume facility into Surat. Obviously, uh, the challenge for Forever Mark and opportunity is as we open up more mature markets, particularly America, uh, where the, uh, we're making good progress and where the majority of larger diamonds in the world are consumed, very importantly, those, many of those diamonds that are cut and polished uh, in Botswana, uh, then there becomes opportunity as they build their share of the Forever Mark business uh, with us that, uh, that it makes then economic sense to locate that facility right next to where the production is. So I think it's something we watch that space uh, uh, for the future and as our half carrot and up business builds, um, there'll be a lot of economic sense to, to making that efficient process here in Gaborone as well. Um, the, the question of synthetics comes up, and it's getting, it's getting a lot of news coverage uh, in America, largely because people have developing the, uh, at least publicizing the ability to uh, manufacture uh, a synthetic diamond that um, looks like a gem. Um, it's not actually a new capability. You know, De Beers Industrial Division has had that capability for a very long time, but. Uh, so it's not new to the world. Uh, De Beers sees that opportunity very much in the industrial space, which is actually quite exciting opportunities uh, when one looks at some of the properties of diamond. But I think it's a, it's a good question, and it is one that, uh, as, a, uh, as an industry, you know, we need to make sure we uh, are prepared for. Our key focus today is around the issue of, of uh, what we call undisclosed sales, so detection. We need to make sure that, um, uh, unfortunately, compared to most any other sector who struggles with uh, imitations, we're in a very strong position, much stronger, for example, than the art market, because we've invested over a very long time at De Beers at our research and development center uh, in the, the science and the technology to, to allow us to quickly, easily, and cost-effectively uh, detect any and every uh, synthetic uh, masquerading uh, as a precious stone. So we're in a strong position technology-wise, and our focus now is making sure that the, that equipment is widely available uh, at all points through the industry so the consumer, again, can buy uh, a, a diamond uh, with confidence. You know, when it comes to consumer desire, well, that's, that's our task. We've got a precious, rare, and, and special product with an inherent and lasting value. Um, and the last time I looked at synthetics, they don't meet that criteria. They may sparkle and they may be crystallized carbon, but uh, it's a long way to be a miracle of nature. But that's our task, to make sure that people understand, uh, consumers around the world understand uh, the difference, 
uh, they understand what makes diamonds special and valuable, and then you know, it's up to them to buy the product that they, that they want. Uh, that's the way of the competitive world. Um, undermining an environment, I think that is a good question. It is one becoming more important because I think, um, I think uh, the, the millennial audiences are far more interested. But to be honest, we all should be. Huh? We're all citizens of, the, citizens of the world, and it's our planet, and we need to take care of it. I think there is a sense somehow that mining is a dam environmental damaging. I tell you, in my long experience uh, with De Beers and the other major diamond mining companies, it's not something that I feel is true. I think that, uh, that well, I'll speak for myself and not for the others, but uh, uh, you know, we're extraordinarily uh, uh, environmentally conscious about the, uh, the land around the communities in which we work, around issues like biodiversity, around issues like water conservation. You know, it's at the top of the agenda of our uh, executive meetings. Um, what, I, what I agree with is that there's a perception which is not really the same as the reality. And you know, I guess we have to take responsibility as an industry for that. Uh, and you're quite right, we need to put that reality right in the, or the perception right with the reality uh, of what actually happens because, um, because diamonds are just, you know, too important to these uh, countries in southern Africa for perceptions which don't match reality to impact on demand. I mean, the good that diamonds do in a place like Botswana, I think, is obvious to anyone who comes here. Uh, and to put that at risk because of a perception around mining, which isn't true, diamond mining, um, well, that's our responsibility to make sure it, it doesn't happen. And I think lastly was when is Forevermark coming to Africa? Well, I can finally, after coming here for years and saying soon, uh, it's available today uh, in South Africa, where we uh, have, uh, have brought the Forevermark, and even better, we've got our first uh, store opened in Botswana. So finally, after years of, uh, of people here in Botswana asking me, Where, why can't I buy a Botswana diamond here? You can. Next stop is Gaba Road, I promise. Thank you very much. Stephen, thank you very much. I'd like to now hand over to the capable hands of Sheila Kama, who's director of the Africa Natural Resource Center, to come up and chair the next panel on diversified growth and development. So there'll be a couple of minutes just as we change over. Thank you very much. Can I quickly invite the panelists to join me, please? Uh, Leta, Dumi, and Malibu. Hi. Hi, Dumi. Good to see you, Casey. Hi, Leta. Hi. 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 Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, the organizer have just given me a drill on how to run this. And in true uh, Sheila style, I will ignore him. I shall do that which my passion suggests is the right thing to do. But I do also hope that in the process, I will make it meaningful for everyone. I was reminded when I listened to Stephen Lucia of why we are here, which is, of course, to help Botswana uh, in moving with but beyond diamonds. But also, I was reminded of the role that Botswana has to play in driving demand and infusing confidence and inspiring uh, consumption of diamonds. And as I looked at the topics of discussion this morning, they speak very directly to something that Stephen said. 
which is that as the technology for uh, marketing and advertising diamonds uh, changes from printed media to digital media, it does something which previously was not the case. It immediately and instantaneously links the consumers of diamond jewelry with the producers of uh, rough diamonds, including here in Botswana. Just as there is the expectation in China, the United States, India, and elsewhere, that diamonds might live up to the integrity of the products. Increasingly, the young people in Botswana, and old people for that matter, increasingly expect that Botswana and DBS must also live to the expectations of what diamonds do for them. And if you think about it, that really is why we are here. And so when I looked at the, the subject of promoting local content, it occurred to me that one of the most important things that we can do as we contemplate this concept of local content is to think, what is the locality about which we speak? Is it the entire world of uh, diamond consumers? Or is it the entire world of uh, diamond producers? Or is it, for that matter, the communities in which the mines are? I think it's very important we think about what the locality is that we wish to talk about. But I think it's also important to think about the content in that local content. What is it that will be meaningful? Which, if we bring on board, will link the sentiment of the consumer uh, with the sentiment of the producers and make sure that not only uh, are the producer countries themselves drivers of demand, but that the way in which Botswana is branded as the premier source of rough diamonds lives up to the reality of Forever Mark. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me just remind us, uh, we are live. You will be quoted. Uh, let me remind the speakers that you have 15 minutes and that we invite you to please briefly introduce yourself, but uh, very quickly cut to the chase. So with those few words, I invite Dr. Malibu Bakwena, who will be speaking on the subject promoting local content and non-mining domestic industrial development. And good morning, Kama. Too short. Dumelambo Malavora. Hali Dumeli. It's morning for those who are not from here. Uh, I've been asked to share my thoughts on uh, promoting local content and non-mining domestic industrial development in uh, Botswana. Our former Vice President, Reki Dikule, um, urged us not to dwell too much on the past, uh, but I think uh, it is also critical to use the past as a point of reference. So I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the past before I map a way forward. You know, when I was given uh, this topic and from what we were discussing yesterday, um, a question to, came to my mind. Why is it necessary to promote local content and non-mining domestic industrial uh, development, given that Botswana has avoided the resource curse? Shouldn't we be content? Haven't we arrived? Why is it an issue to talk about promoting local content? Or in other words, uh, talk about changing things. Why are we changing? It's not, um, why are we fixing something that is okay? So that's the first thing that came uh, to my mind. But then from yesterday, um, by now you are aware that uh, diamond mining is non-renewable and it's finite they're going to get depleted at some point. And the second uh, issue that um, you can pick from yesterday is that they're capital intensive. They only employ a small proportion of uh, the economy. And as such, we need to, um, you know, we, we need to, um, have other linkages rather than the fiscal uh, linkage. 
And then, um, you know, taxation from Dr. Jeffrey's uh, discussion. He talked about uh, taxation and export revenue that is highly dependent on the mining sector, and that's not uh, desirable. So that's why, even though we are where we are, we need to think of a future without uh, the diamonds. And because of these reasons, um, generally, uh, development economists shun mining activities. From as far back as 1893, Adam Smith, um, called mining activities or considered mining activities as unprosperous projects. And it is because of uh, those issues that, are, that surround diamond mining that uh, as a country, we've made attempts to promote uh, domestic industrialization, hence local content. Or we've uh, f uh, come up with policies that try to um, you know, include an ordinary uh, Motswana, not just the few that are employed by the uh, sector. And in our attempts, in 1984, we came up with uh, an industrial development policy. And that policy emphasized that it is through import substitution that industrialization would be achieved. And it was expected that domestic demand would be driven by the manufacturing sector. So we tried um, industrializing as far back as 1984. However, things change. You know, the world doesn't um, stay static, things change. Uh, globalization and international competition necessitated a shift uh, to export-based activities. And because of that, we came up with IDP 1998, IDP, the Industrial Development Policy. And through that uh, policy, we've had both the cedars and the layers and so on and so forth. And um, it was then, in 1998, or after introducing 1998, that we found out that there was no coordination and uh, in terms of the direction, we were not sure what we were doing. We were groping in the dark. And we decided to come up with IDP 2014. And with the IDP 2014, though it still aims to promote uh, local content through sustainable and globally competitive industries, it is uh, coordinated by what is called a national um, what is it called again? National Economic Diversification Council. And, you know, something has happened. You know, since two, 2005, for instance, latest uh, Bank of Botswana statistics show that um, contribution of mining has actually reduced. And if you look at the manufacturing uh, sector, to be specific, between 2005 and 2014, we've had an increase from 4.8 to 6%. So something has uh, happened. And on the basis of that, my question is, what's the way forward? How, what, what do we need to do? Um, pardon? Oh, I thought somebody was talking. <laughs> Mr. Thiever uh, yesterday said uh, there is no one size fits all solution. So I'm going to propose uh, something based on what others are doing. Um, it might not solve our, all our problems, but uh, you know we have to start somewhere. The first um, uh, thing that I would uh, like for us to do is to set targets. Set, um, what does setting uh, targets uh, mean? In addition to stay, uh, stipulating time frames, uh, there's a need to set specific targets. For instance, for every pillar that is spent, the, um, you know, one or policymakers should ask themselves, what is the target in terms of the output? What is the target in terms of uh, the increases in manufacturing, for instance? Do we want a 1% every year? Do we want 0.5% every year? Rather than saying we want to stimulate the manufacturing sector, we have to be specific. That way we are able to uh, assess uh, how far we've gone and what needs uh, to be uh, done. So in terms of setting targets, uh, if you think of the kafala, what we talked about yesterday, 
We were told that it helped 150 entrepreneurs uh, since its inception in 2011 or 10? 20, yeah, 2014, last year. And about uh, 2.5 million US dollars was committed. Does this mean success? Those who've benefited, the 150 entrepreneurs, is it success or failure? We can't tell, or I can't tell, in the sense that we don't have targets. Were we targeting 2,000? If we're targeting 2,000, then 150 is a joke. So we need to set those uh, uh, targets. And then from the government side, for instance, in the State of the Nation 2015, it was reported that 15% um, or rather the 15% maintenance res reservation program has assisted uh, youth-owned uh, con construction companies and um, they've been helped to the tune of 168 million pula and 250 youth have benefited. Is that success or failure? Is it uh, succeeding? You can't tell because we know, don't know what the specific target is. How many youth do we want to participate in the program? I've done something, sorry. To improve, uh, the second thing that we can do is to improve implementation uh, capacity. Yesterday, you know, everybody talked about lack of implementation capacity as far as our projects are, or our policies are concerned. And in fact, uh, Morris and his co-authors in 2012 concluded uh, that um, there is no joined up policy. And joined up po policy is a key effective um, industrial strategy. He was saying that on the basis of contradictory uh, responses from government officials and private sector on the responses from, um, you know, um, government, yeah, on the government's capacity to implement its policies for cutting and polishing and the private sector's willingness to implement beneficiation uh, strategies. The third thing, um, is that the private sector needs to engage with the government proactively, and they should also play an enabling uh, role. The Kafala is a good um, example of such partnership, but um, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't only be limited to DBS, Botswana, or Anglo-American. The private sector as a whole. Um, you know, they, they, they don't play that proactive uh, role. And, you know, um, if you look at countries like Norway, um, the new Norwegian uh, government set up um, three companies when they first discovered their uh, oil. And one of those companies, Stat Oil, entered into a partnership with uh, British Petroleum in the 1980s. 80s. And through these uh, partnerships, uh, partnership skills and technologies were shared. So we can have uh, something uh, like that. And collaboration is also important because it can assist the SMMEs penetrate the international uh, market, an issue that was raised uh, yesterday. Um, and finally, SMMEs should uh, network and build uh, alliances so that they can compete uh, globally and effectively. One of the issues that was raised yesterday was that the SMMEs are not able to uh, compete globally, so they can forge those uh, alliances. An example, um, the Mauritius textile industry networked and forged alliances with the foreign companies, and uh, through that, they were able to compete uh, uh, globally. So thank you. I was told I, 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 I talked too much. So thank you. I have to cut it. Actually, Malibu misrepresent me. I just alerted her to the time. But of course, she doesn't talk too much. She talks appropriately. But unfortunately, we do have to manage time. Um, in the world of diamonds, 
women are a very important component of the value chain, if only because they are the primary consumers and they are the ones who inspire men uh, to purchase diamonds. But around the 1990s, we also found a new emerging trend, which is that actually women, because they are more financially empowered, are increasingly purchasers of diamonds in their own right. The second speaker is going to give us another aspect of women and their role in the diamond industry. What we aspire to is that women are equal contributors in the diamond value chain, both in the production of diamonds, uh, in supplying of services to diamond manufacturers and others, but also in the decision making. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dumi Mbakanye. Dumi. Um, all protocol observed, um, good morning. I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm a woman in business. I look out for myself and my fellow women in business, so my presentation is gonna follow that route. And I'm hoping that um, by the end of it all, the business people in this room will be able to, we have an opportunity this morning. We have Debswana in the room, we have DBS in the room, we have the ministry in the room. We'll have an opportunity to just tell them what they should do. Uh, just a brief background of who WIBA is. WIBA is a Women in Business Association. We are an affiliation of BOKIM, and we exist to ensure that uh, women, more women should be counted amongst the wealthy elite in the country. Another concern as an association is we get, we, we've noticed that fewer women are active in construction, engineering, and even the mining um, industry. So I'm hoping that by the end of this session, we should be able to just unravel and say, what, well, why, why is it like that? Yesterday was an interesting day. There was a couple of issues thrown around. We've had a 50-year partnership between Debswana and our government. But what we should be asking ourselves this morning is, have indigenous Botswana benefited from this growing GDP that was caused by the minerals? Have the youth benefited? Have women benefited? That's food for thought. Someone mentioned, it was Ryan, that as much as we have a rise in GDP, there is a, a contrasting um, widening income inequality, which apparently is the trend with economies, uh, with, with mineral uh, potent economies. I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that there should be a solution. There should be somehow how this gap can be closed or lessened. I would love us to, you know, just this morning during this session to just tackle on that. When diamonds aren't selling, everything stops. Contractors' contracts are stopped. People lose their jobs. And the mining towns become ghost towns or the surrounding communities become ghost areas. Is that an ideal situation? I don't think so. That has to change. The latest DBS report, which we had the pleasure of um, having access to yesterday, stated that Joanne Mine is actually the, the world's richest mine in terms of value. Have we seen those, that, that benefit or that prestige trickling down to us as a country? It's great that um, the CEO of Debswana actually tackled that, and indeed, that Debswana has spent so much in terms of education, because in terms of skills, uh, competency, we are quite at a higher level. But the key question is, are the surrounding areas around joining area, are those, the community, is the sponsorship strategy of Debswana or DBS, is it focused or linked to the needs of the surrounding communities? That's food for thought. For those minds that are already involved in community outreach uh, initiatives, through where, whether it's registered trusts or whatever, how do we gauge the relevancy of that? Is it relevant, the community uh, projects that they do? Is it adequate? It's nice to look on paper. It's nice to see that there's a clinic that's running. It's nice. But 
is, is it adequate, is it not about time that this is measured? I'm just gonna touch on the case of women in business in Botswana. Then my next discussion will be the case for women in business in Botswana. Who are we? What's the makeup of women in business in Botswana? The majority of women in business in Botswana are in the informal sector. The minority who are in the formal sectors are still not in the mainstream economies. They are in your textiles, catering, events management. It's not about time that more women in the, these formalized areas play a role in engineering, in drilling for Debswana, in you know, putting up infrastructure, and that can we, you know, as, as, as we go through this morning, can we think about that? I've categorized our sectors in terms of women in business. We have the informal sector. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly, because of time constraints, I wish I had more time. I'm just gonna quickly get to what we recommend as an association that Debswana and related mining companies should do regarding the respective sectors. We have the informal sector. These are women who sell bread every morning. These are women who sell your airtime, your FFV, which is your fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. And I have no doubt that these women form part of the surrounding communities in the mining towns, in the mining areas. Our recommendation, so that it's a double-pronged uh, benefit for both Debswana and, 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 and the country, is maybe a microfinance fund should be, should, be, should be created. This microfinance fund would be funded by the, the funds would be provided by Debswana. It will be managed by a local consultant, which is now another area where we are empowering a local consultant. And it would benefit the community around, both the traders, the small traders, and the, the, just the general community in terms of whatever needs they might need. Another recommendation under the informal sector issue is maybe an area could be cleared um, around the, these mining towns where there's a market area that's created, a concerted market area, and, and that should happen. The second sector, as I've already mentioned, is currently we have the formal sector, where the current space of women in business now is your florists, is your catering, great, great areas, no, you know, no credit given to them. But it's not about time that a woman who's running a catering company is elevated and now owns a hotel, a chain of hotels. That's what we should be thinking about. So in terms of this type of woman who's currently in this sector, they could be providers of products and services to mining companies like Debswana. And an EDP like the Tokafala program could be expanded because we need more uh, yeah, we, yeah we, we, we need more women to be actually on that program, in you know, So it's, yeah, thank you. So, we, we, you know, so that's the recommendation that, you know, we have more women being engaged, you know, as, as, as a strategy where it's concerted, you say it's intended, we're going to have, we have this target, someone mentioned targets earlier, we have this target of having 40 or 50 percent of women, women or majority owned businesses. Then we have a third sector which is a desired sector. The two sectors I've mentioned are the current, this is the current makeup of how we are as women in business. The desired sector is now where we want to see more women in engineering. Our government has paid, it has taken quite a couple of uh, women to, to, you know, to, to, to go to school for some of these technical courses. I understand it's not enough. So our recommendation then regarding this is maybe right from when we are born, right from our societal uh, backgrounds, uh, women must be encouraged to get into these technical um, courses. But secondly, for those who are already, who prefer maybe the formal employment, they must be enticed to, to, you know, to, to, to be able to supply Debswana. Our recommendation is capacity building. Debswana should have an arrangement where it's a pre-award arrangement that before, uh, for major contracts, before we award you a drilling contract, you should, as a male counterpart who's experienced, handhold a woman who's fresh in the industry. 
for a stipulated period of time, then they would graduate from that program. That's the type of partnership and inclusion um, that, that we, you know, we recommend. The value chain of the beneficiation um, would love to partake at the tail end of the jewelry manufacturing and jewelry retail, which uh, fortunately people haven't gotten into yet in this country. So we are hoping there will be concerted efforts for women to play a huge role in that, as we, you know, we love our diamonds, we love our jewelry. Um, quickly, I know I'm left with three, three minutes, <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, I'm just gonna quickly take you through just general challenges that women in business face and how companies like uh, Debswana can come on board in terms of just the inclusive engagement because that's the topic of the day. A lot of our women have an adequate market exposure. One, Botswana in terms of population is not that, um, you know, it's not that, that conducive. So that it, it, uh, it's national, regional, and international markets. What we are currently doing as an association is to expose our members to exports, to market fairs, but what now Debswana can do? Debswana can tackle this national market issue. The question that I asked Inega yesterday, that you want in terms of your procurement within your Debswana uh, quota, for it, some of it to be reserved for women in business. In terms of regional and international markets, we piggyback on the already existing relationship. Then we get your Debswana associates who are in the region or who are international, who are part of this program to also benefit from that. Um, women have limited, I know this, uh, my male counterparts always say, it's not, an issue, it's not an issue of women. There's limited access to funding in this country. Um, recently, the CEO of CEDA did cite that out of the 10, 10 beneficiaries um, of CEDA uh, money, only two were women. We're yet to establish and unravel why that's the case. But in the meantime, we're training our members in terms of just being, uh, you know, putting themselves as a brand and submitting a sellable uh, business plans. But a proposed, uh, what we propose now is tokafala or other EDPs that could actually come on board. Should have training seminars on business planning and linkages to finance by experts. I'm happy they're already doing that, but we need more women into that quota. Then um, history has shown that women, even though there were no regulations against women owning property, just by the nature of who we are, men have owned property for a long time. So in this day today, where for any woman who will be able to succeed because banks want security, any bank you go to, whether you want 50,000 or 20,000, they want security. So it's only the woman who has a supportive partner who's able to utilize the property. All right, I'm, I'm just, I'm, wind, I'm winding up. Who's able to utilize the property of their, their spouse. We are saying, can Debswana or DBS come up with a credit guarantee scheme? to take uh, account of such um, an, an, an anomalies. Um, am I, am I, have I run out of my time? Um, you know, you see, there's just so much to talk about, uh, but yeah, so can I just, just quickly, one, just one minute, and then I'll, for the rest of the presentation, uh, for those who want to have hold of it, I've printed it so you can, you can have it. Um, in conclusion, we are saying, for inclusive, sorry, for inclusive engagement um, of women or business people, companies like Debswana should employ locals, procurement of services should be from locals, training of SMEs, there should be a quota for women, technology transfer between um, the bigger businesses and the smaller ones, research, regular research and development uh, you know, efforts to ensure that we, we are on, on in touch with what, what's happening, and a percentage of diamond sales to go into the content development fund for increased uh, locals and SMEs access to finance and capacity building. And mining companies should also have support health interventions in the areas that they operate with, you know, within. If they have a clinic, uh, you know, residents should be able to have access to that clinic for free, uh, HIV testing, blood pressure testing, and so forth. Um, that's the, it's not the end of my presentation, but I'm, I'm chased off the stage, but thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dumi. The truth of the matter is that the issues about which Dumi spoke are very important. 
Uh, but if it's any comfort to me, in truth, Botswana is not alone, nor is that I'm an industry. Working as I do now in 54 African states, I can tell you that every one of those countries struggles with the same uh, dilemma of how to harness what is in most countries 50% of its entire human asset. Two things seem peculiar. One, there seems to be almost in every country the enrollment of girls at primary, secondary, and tertiary is higher than boys. The performance academically of boys and girls, uh, the girls outdo the boys. There seems to me an inexplicable change when they, after post-graduation uh, university, women drop out of the workforce. And it seems to me that this is neither a, an industry peculiar thing, but it's the way society attaches value. It seems to me that women and men, our sons and daughters, see us as more valuable as married women staying home than working. The reverse is true for men. Men are perceived to be more valuable, uh, more meaningfully engaged if they are working. My sense is that if I ask any one of your men to go home and stay and nurture the children, that you would feel somehow marginalized. That, it seems to me, more than anything else, is the spanner in the work. How do we change this and make sure that women are seen uh, differently? With those few words, I'd now like to invite uh, my friend, uh, Leta Musianyane, an architect and uh, the president of the Botswana Confederation of Commerce, Industry, and Manpower. Leta. Good morning. Allow me to say all protocol observed. Director of Ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank Chatham House, Mayor, DBS, for organizing this very important event and indeed for inviting me to be amongst those who contribute to the discussions of the two days. <clears throat> This best testimony, if any was ever really required, of the BS and <clears throat> their partners' long-standing commitment to Botswana. Since independence in 1966, the government has been the leading player in the economy and involved in almost every economic activity. But notably, government has been wise and careful in utilizing the, the mineral revenue to benefit the wider economy, especially infrastructure and education. Government also realized the need to nurture those who endeavor to set up their own enterprises by creating a number of businesses, business support institutions, such as LEA, CEDA, BNPC, BOBS, and BITC. I know these have been mentioned, so I wouldn't go beyond the acronyms. Obviously, the idea was to create a very robust trade support network that would act as an anchor for our SME, SMMEs in particular. As a result of all these wise decisions and good initiatives, Botswana moved from being a, a least developed country to a middle income status. The per capita income is now amongst the highest in the sub-Saharan region. At the same time, it is notable that government has been slow in releasing its grip on the economic activities where the private sector should be taking the lead, such as provision of uh, utilities and other services. It is inevitable that our time over time, efficiency and innovation become a challenge for governments and the de delivery of such services gets compromised. The political will with respect to supporting private sector growth in Botswana is evident through many initiatives of the government, but it has taken a very long, very strong private sector voice, such as Business Botswana, to achieve economic reforms that have seen our country to being amongst the best reformers in the region. 
Such reforms as, <clears throat> as reduction of corporate tax, liberalization of exchange controls, and outsourcing, quite com commendable. The most important avenue for local business to grow is in the value addition and being part of the global supply chain. Botswana is part of the SADC region can contribute significantly in the aggregation of minerals as it is already happening with diamonds. The development of the diamond sector in Botswana has resulted in beneficiation, thus adding value for better returns. If we are to meaningfully benefit from trade agreements such as the EPAS, this is exactly what the region requires. Being located at the center of SADC region and having developed the skill and expertise with the diamonds aggregation presents a golden opportunity for Botswana to replicate this into other communities in subsectors such as copper, nickel, and coal. The current economic climate of soft commodity prices adds impetus for Botswana to reform the business environment and usher in a dynamic, resilient, globally competitive and diversified private sector. Therefore, any support to the business sector should focus on reforms that will improve the business environment, especially in the areas where we are lagging behind. Such areas have been identified in the world doing business report as one, paying taxes, two, construction permits, three, starting a business, and finally, trading across borders. That is where we are weakest. Further, according to the World Economic Forum competitiveness, competitiveness report, education enrollment rates in our country at all levels remain low by international standards. And the quality of the education systems receives mediocre marks. This obviously has implications for our ability to develop skills. Going forward, it is therefore in the interest of government and the private sector to find effective ways of raising the overall quality of our education system, most notably in the areas of mathematics and science to deliver the right skill set. It will also be critical going forward to ensure that procedures for claiming back training expenses under the training levy are simplified so that companies do not simply treat the levy as another tax. We still have issues with attracting global talent. Investors, both domestic and foreign, need certainty and predictability in order to plan their operations. It is important, once again, for the private sector to continue to engage the government to ensure that a transparent, predictable, and objective system for recruiting global talent is put in place. Another challenge is privatization. Since 1996, Business Botswana has been at the forefront of efforts to privatize the myriad of state-owned enterprises. The process remains painfully slow but we are hopeful that the initial public offering of Botswana Telecommunication Corporation Limited, BTCL, will finally take place before the end of this year. The IPO was postponed on several occasions and therefore risks undermining our credibility in the investment community. The issue of entrepreneurship development, especially amongst the youth, it's critical to improving the lives of many young Botswana who are currently unemployed. The DBS group working with the Botswana government have in the past addressed the issue of entrepreneurship development and access to finance through schemes such as PEO. It is now clear and given the lessons learned that business in this part of the world requires more than just cash. 
There is a critical need for business linkages to create market access, technology transfer, and management skills. Business Botswana and DBS Global Sales are working on a partnership with a view to contributing towards SME, SME development. This partnership, which seeks to foster a relationship with the top 10 GDP contributors of this country, is intended to add value to the growth of SMMEs in Botswana through subcontracting, men mentoring, and strong advocacy for a conducive environment, but more importantly, to address the bottleneck that have been identified above. It is my hope that this meeting will help to bring out the real issues that are worthy of consideration by important stake stakeholders such as ourselves and Business Botswana, leading the way to the growth of the private sector, especially SMEs. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much for those uh, inspiring words. Um, I was reminded listening to Letta that Botswana, like many countries, is very unique, if peculiar. One of the peculiarities of Botswana is that Botswana, as a country or a government, is first of all the largest generator of revenue for its economy, but it's also the biggest driver of expenditure. This is quite uh, a challenge, I think, because of course in many countries it's the reverse. The governments create an environment in which industry thrives and generates uh, revenue through taxation and others. And I think if, if one really thinks about what we must do to crack Botswana's story, is to change this dynamic. You cannot have a government which is essentially uh, both its own source of subs sustenance, but also the one that puts money into the market to fuel the economy. And in many ways, I think when you speak about the grip that the government has in the economy. It sits in that space. Uh, and, and so I think that brings us rather nicely to uh, Ross's uh, uh, enormous task of helping us think through the idea of how we can diversify this economy, including uh, reducing some of the public sector footprint in Botswana's economy. Thank you, Ross, you are most welcome. Good morning. Um, I want to begin by extending my gratitude to Chatham House and to De Beers. Chatham House, thank you very much for organizing a brilliant conference. I think we all know that it, uh, it takes a lot of work behind the scenes to get something like this up and running. Uh, and to De Beers, uh, not only thank you for partnering with Chatham House, but thank you also for uh, providing employment for my parents, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm here. Uh, I grew up on De Beers Mines, uh, not in Botswana. Uh, I was born in Sidi Bipikwe while my father still worked for BCL. Um, and so BCL is still going, uh, which probably had little to do with, uh, with my parents, but uh, there, it, uh, there it is. Um, I work for the South African Institute of International Affairs, which uh, I, I suppose could best be described as Chatham House's sister Institute uh, in South Africa. Certainly we try and model ourselves on Chatham House. We've been looking at Botswana since April last year, trying to understand options for economic diversification. Uh, it's a difficult task, um, and I do want to thank uh, especially Dr. Keith Jeffress for his insights and uh, taking time to speak with us uh, about where Botswana is at. Uh, and to the people we've spoken to across the, the length and breadth of Botswana, thank you for taking the time. All right, uh, Botswana has been a star performer uh, in the African context, certainly since independence in 1965. Uh, here you have an indication of how well Botswana has done between 2001 and 2011. I've averaged these figures just to give you an idea of how Botswana has performed regionally uh, over the last 10 years. Now, past performance uh, in this respect is probably not a good indicator of future performance uh, it's a little bit like uh, asset fund managers trying to beat the market. Uh, and one thing you can say, for instance, is that uh, if Coronation won over the last 10 years, it's not going to win over the next 10 years. 
Uh, but what Botswana does need to do is harness some of what it's learned uh, over the successful period and implement it uh, in, a, in a new direction once diamond revenue starts to decline. And the modeling, uh, the projections indicate that that will be from next year onwards uh, insofar as you can trust economic projections. Uh, as an economist, I would say uh, just uh, be wary of the numbers. Important things to point out here is that Botswana, in terms of household consumption, has grown phenomenally well. Uh, and that's a much better indicator of uh, social welfare than GDP per capita. Uh, and even where Mozambique has outstripped Botswana in terms of per capita growth, that has been off a low base. Um, in addition, Botswana's governance indicators suggest that it has performed far better than its counterparts. Those governance indicators are taken from the World Bank's governance indicators, uh, and they run on a normal distribution kind of from minus 2.5 to 2.5. So if you score 2.5, you're doing very well. Uh, if you score less than zero, you're, you're not doing very well. So it's important to mention this because governance indicators are essentially an outcome of the quality of your institutions. Institutions are a bit harder to pin down. You, you can't, economists are arguing all the time about how to measure and define them, and uh, it's difficult. But one thing you can say is that governance indicators are a strong outcome of the quality of institutions. So Botswana is, is doing well, and in a resource-rich context, the importance of that cannot be overstated. Uh, you need strong quality institutions because they're the determining feature of whether your resources are captured by the elite or whether they are invested in human capital and economic diversification. And this, of course, is the challenge that Botswana faces. And I think that Dr. Jeffers is right in saying that we've, Botswana has essentially had well-managed good luck. Uh, and it now needs to move away from having put money into expanding the public sector and so on, a large part of which was necessary, uh, into finding new sources of growth. Because the social contract depends on that uh, to, to some degree. Okay, so the other important thing to note there is that under five mortality in, in Botswana is really low in comparison to uh, some of the other countries I've selected as case comparisons. Under five mortality gives you an indication of a country's ability to tackle poverty. It's a sensitive indicator of poverty. So Botswana has done well there despite the, uh, the, the enormous HIV burden and there's indication that our government has been successful in reversing some of the effects of that. Uh, and then moreover, despite assertions that the economy is not diversified, uh, it is evident that the structure of GDP and the extent to which government relies on diamond revenues has shrunk. So th this table gives you an indication that uh, only around a third, in fact less than a third of government's revenue 2014-15 uh, will come from diamonds per se. Well, from mineral revenues per se. Uh, what that doesn't tell us, though, is the extent to which other sources of government revenue are directly or indirectly dependent on mining, uh, on, on diamond mining especially. Um, so where, where the picture does indeed become a little more bleak uh, is with an examination of Botswana's export basket. And this picture from the, the Bank of Botswana shows you quite clearly that 82.6% uh, of exports in 2013 came from diamonds. The figure is somewhat misleading because 28.5% of imports are also diamonds. Uh, and that indicates the relative success of government's commitment to getting De Beers to move its site sales from London to Gavroni and to set up polishing and cutting factories here. Uh, either way, Diamonds fund about 85% of Botswana's import purchasing power. So in other words, diamonds constitute, well, as a proportion of, of total exports to total imports, you have an 85 to 1 ratio. So diamonds fund Botswana's purchasing power. Uh, and that has to change uh, because diamond mining is not forever as much as diamonds can be forever. So the vexing question remains, what do we do? Uh, and this is where we, we hope to have some debate. Uh, you can strategize all you like, but we need some practical options. And 
And before you can find new sources of growth that move entirely away from natural resources, you, you have to consider that Botswana has a significant mineral endowment outside of diamonds. Uh, the question is, what do we do with those, especially uh, in a, a commodity cycle downturn? As you all know, Botswana is cold abundant uh, with indicated reserves of at least 9 billion tons uh, under the ground, inferred resources of 212 billion tons. So that is an enormous amount of coal, uh, some of which sits under the central Kalahari, so we probably don't want to touch that. Um, so with current coal prices at historical lows, unlikely to recover, especially given that India is really the only last remaining genuine uh, supply deficit market into which Botswana could sell. Uh, and with climate change pressures on countries, uh, it's unclear that coal exports are the way to go. Certainly if the, if the infrastructure was already in place, it may be a viable option. But in order to build a Trans-Kalahari railway line uh, that would cost you at least $11 billion uh, plus another $20 billion over the next 30 years to maintain, you'd need a coal price. Uh, the calculations are difficult, but we reckon you'd, you'd need between $60 and $70 a ton free on board uh, to justify the building of that kind of railway line. You'd also need to demonstrate spillover economic benefits, uh, which across Namibia and Botswana uh, four million people, uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that those spillover benefits are necessarily there. Uh, and then it's not just the price and it's not just the infrastructure, it's the fact that Botswana's thermal coal, uh, which is what it would export, is of a relatively low calorific value, which means that it would need to be washed unless uh, non-washing technology were implemented, which is available. Uh, but either way, the, the washing of coal uh, requires a huge amount of water, which Botswana frankly doesn't have. Um, that's a picture we took at um, Marupule, just to uh, indicate that we have been there and uh, we, we have some idea of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, Marupule, currently owned by Debswana, uh, produces 3.2 million tons uh, per annum uh, with, with plans to expand uh, into an open cast mine. The underground mine has been going since 1972 uh, and has been enormously safe and successful. Uh, it's only been owned by Debswana since 2012, if I remember correctly. In addition to coal, iron ore resources are also abundant. Uh, block one, sorry, I know you can't see this very well, but block one right up there next to the northwestern corner of the panhandle uh, holds 440 million tons of indicated reserves. Uh, and block two has between five and seven billion tons of inferred resources. Now those are just different levels of uh, geological confidence. Um, but this is magnetite iron ore, uh, and so, okay. so contrary to hematite iron ore, which is uh, what you have in Pilbara and what you have in Guinea, uh, the water requirements to extract iron from, uh, from the magnetite are, are quite intensive. Uh, and with global majors trying to sit on iron ore assets uh, to limit supply to uh, to an oversupplied market uh, with excess processing capacity in China, it's very difficult to justify to investors why they should invest in Botswana's iron extraction. Um, and of course, this creates a bit of difficulty, right? Governments are putting pressure on mining companies to extract. Uh, there's, there's a lot of emphasis in mining codes across Africa uh, of use it or lose it. So if you hold the asset, you're under obligation to use it. And in fact, the, Part of the argument for why Rio Tinto originally lost its rights to Simundu in Guinea in 2008 was because government said they weren't using the resource. But as a, as a global major, you, you don't want to uh, oversupply the market, uh, especially if your primary deposit is, uh, is struggling uh, to get iron into the market as it is. Um, so that means that iron ore exports are all, also a difficult proposition uh, at the moment. Uh, there is talk of using a potential trans kalahari railway line to pick up the iron ore from Shikawi at Khanzi, uh, but to get the iron ore to Khanzi is, uh, is even a logistical hurdle uh, and would probably require a slurry pipeline which has its own challenges, uh, especially uh, pertaining to the water that would be required to ship it down there. 
Uh, and then moreover, the obvious challenge is that uh, the iron ore sits right next to the Okavango Delta Panhandle, uh, one of the world's most sensitive ecological systems. Uh, and so you really have to be sure that you invite reputable players to extract the resource uh, that will contribute to the preservation of the area rather than uh, its destruction. So government, uh, I know that government is going to go ahead with a feasibility study uh, regarding the Trans-Kalahari Railway Line and options for export. It's, it's our suggestion, it's our recommendation that in fact, uh, if it be put into understanding the complementarities between coal, iron ore and copper, nickel and how those could be harnessed uh, within country before considering the export of raw material. You've got low value, high bulk commodities here which could potentially be used internally. And this is where we uh, need to think outside the box. I'm neither a metallurgist nor an engineer, so I, I don't fully understand exactly how you get you know, from iron ore to steel. But what is an option is to add value to iron ore in Piqui using coal that you could pick up between Shikawi and Piqui uh, from Marupule uh, and process into either super scrap or pig iron, which sells at 400 dollars a ton as opposed to $60 a ton or, or less, uh, given the current iron ore price. Um, so the, the, the potential for value add is huge, and the capital startup requirements of processing uh, smelters in Salibi Piqui would be between $8 and $15 million, depending which specification you went for. Given the existing smelting capacities in Piqui and government's plans you know, to create Piqui as a hub, this option may make sense. And the philosophy here from a development economics perspective is to try and ensure that one thing leads to another. You have to have an alternative revenue stream uh, that will take you from diamonds to something else that will be able to build infrastructure. Um, in fact, I, I just do, it's important to say here that with, with adding value to iron ore, um, you have to do a, more intense market research than what has been done to see what the demand dynamics are in the region. Because if you produce super scrap or pig iron in Piqui, you want to be sure that you can actually export it into the region um, because that's where you would have transport cost advantages. Um, I wanted to finish with this because I thought that what Stephen said earlier was spot on. You, you have to link mining, diamonds especially, to ecotourism. Because in this transition period between declining diamond revenues and finding new sources of growth, ecotourism is probably going to be the anchor that holds Botswana's economy through that transition. Uh, and so if you can link uh, for consumers the uh, experience of buying a diamond with preserving some of the world's greatest heritage under threat, by the way, uh, then, uh, then you have a win. So on that note, uh, and in appreciation of the fact that Botswana holds uh, around half of the world's remaining African elephants, uh, I want to thank you for your time. Um, thank you very much. Listening to Ross, it, it all sounds to me like it's more mining. It, it seems that uh, we just can't win ourselves away from uh, the mining uh, sector. But maybe we can think of diversification in different ways. Maybe we can think of diversifying ownership. I'm struck, why does Debswana own Murubule? The one is a hydrocarbon, the one is a crystal carbon. It requires fundamentally different skills from a marketing. Uh, the risk or, uh, profile is fundamentally different. And so maybe we should just consider that uh, uh, to the decision makers in Botswana that Murupula should be privatized. Maybe that's a form of diversification. Then the state doesn't have to own anything and be accountable for, for everything. Uh, I'm mindful that the former Minister of Minerals and former uh, Vice President here, and he might help us shed some light into why does the state own in any and everything that moves. Um, but I'm also mindful that Botswana doesn't really have many options in terms of the energy mix, and maybe our diversification question sits in the space of what is the appropriate mix of uh, energy supply in Botswana? 
the problem with staying with mining is that your resource care challenges are the same. Your social and environmental legacy challenges are the same. So you really are overburdening yourself if you stay with mining. Or so it looks to me uh, that, you know, this while nature helped us, that maybe we should do a bit more to help ourselves. In a couple of weeks, as many of you will no doubt know, we are in Paris at what is called COP21, which is the forum where the world comes together to determine uh, the agenda for climate change. Countries like Botswana that are uh, coal-based energy dependent are at loggerheads with other parts of the world who deem the unclean nature of coal as inherently uh, counterproductive. As you think of the coal uh, highway, as it were, think about what your argument is in Paris. With a those few words, I'd now like to invite questions and comments from the floor. We have about uh, 15 minutes or so. If I can ask the team doing the audio to spare me the walk up and down and, and activate the mic uh, on the table, please. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, and then that lady, and then uh, the gentleman, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you. It's Maria De Silva, formerly employed at the Chamber of Mines in South Africa. Um, I have two questions for the different um, presenters. Um, and th the first question touches on what the first two presenters um, talked about, which was about creating alliances between SMMEs to increase their power. And I I'd like to know whether any government policies to encourage that and it would also link with um, what the second speaker was saying about the role of women and that most of them um, are involved in micro businesses and how could they perhaps be used in terms of part of the supply chain be it catering or something for the big corporates and again how those could be linked through cooperation to increase their power and also to access to funding um, and just create the critical mass that is required to you know, supply big, big companies. The second question is um, for Ross, and I actually would like to um, reiterate um, or echo what, um, what Sheila said about the continued uh, dependence on um, mineral resources, even though there, are, there won't be diamonds. And, um, and again, talking about this whole thing of you know, climate change and so forth, if we carry on with coal, it's, 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 it's not where the world is going to. And I was just wondering if there were any opportunities in terms of diversification of looking at exploiting the you know, resources that are required out there in the world you know, to counteract the dependence on the non-renewable, and if perhaps you know one couldn't sort of export that and um, and create a whole hub so that it would also link with the whole ecosystem thing that you know that one is talking about. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ineke van der Weyden from Tokafala, and I have a comment for Dr. Bakwena. Um, I really appreciate your forward-looking um, speech with really like practical um, ac actions that we can take. And specifically the targets, I really believe that that's really important, but I would like to take a minute to set the record straight. Because as Tokavala, we have very clear targets. We have impact targets, which I shared yesterday a couple of. Um, and in my 12-minute in my speech yesterday, I might have omitted some other targets that we have, for instance, around enrollment. Um, we have um, yearly enrollment targets as well as program for the total program enrollment targets, which we actually report on on a monthly basis. We have a target of 230 by the end of 2016 and 900 by the end of 2018. And we also actually report on, on met metrics like cost per job supported, so taking the cost combined with the actual impact that we have. So we do keep track of those records, we have targets, we keep track of them and we report on them either monthly or quarterly or annually depending on the particular metric. Thanks. Please, sir. Uh, a mic here, please. 
the gentleman just behind Raki Dikile. Manyana. Mine is more of a comment than a question. Um, we're talking about connecting resources uh, to society. We're talking about economic diversification. And I'm saying that um, our minerals, I would say, have done quite a lot, but they have the potential to do much, much, much more. Diamond beneficiation, let's say diamonds themselves, are a good direct contributor to the economy and to diversification of the economy, both as a direct contributor, I said, and as a catalyst. The whole intention was that diamonds should actually help to trigger other sectors of the economy to diversify the economy. This is an industry that we were told was going to generate about $6 billion per annum, which was previously generated in London. Now the question will be, how much of it has been generated in Botswana? How much has come in, how much has gone out? And if nothing much has been generated, as I don't see much of it having generated here, the question is why? And I would say, basically, that nothing, not much has been done. DTC relocation to Botswana was a windfall. Government decision to benefit diamonds was a windfall. But it doesn't look like we have taken advantage of the windfall to diversify the economy. Now, if, if I look at connecting resources to people, and I look at participation of citizens in the economy, particularly in the diamond industry, it's very, very little. There's virtually nothing. Skills are not there. Knowledge is very limited. So if you keep knowledge away from people, skills away from people, they cannot be creative, they cannot participate. They will only participate at the level of employee. We have got high youth unemployment in this country. We have done nothing to educate our youth, to train our youth to be entrepreneurs. So I'm basically saying that there's quite a lot that has not been done. And there's quite a lot that can be done. Diamonds has got a very big potential even now to trigger this economy, to divest this economy to a high level. I've got quite a lot to say, but she's saying that time is up. But that is my, my view. And if you were to ask me, I would enumerate all of them to tell you exactly how it can be done. I know what should be done. I, I could do it. So there's quite a lot that needs to be done. Both of us need to do it. Let me just, sorry, I'm sorry to say, when uh, former Minister Kidikilo was Minister of Mineral Resources, he gave a speech in Muchudi, I think he was opening some one of the companies there. And he said a very important statement. He said the beneficiation initiative has brought a vista of opportunities for Botswana. And then it call, and said he called, it calls for synergies between governments, private sector, and parastatals. This is not happening. It is, much of it has not happened. Conferences of this nature are very rare. So synergies are not there. So there's quite a lot that is not be done that needs to be done. That is my comment because of time. Uh, thank you. Um, but take Ricky Dikul. I did see you say, but uh, because you had a chance this morning, I'm taking Ricky Dikul, uh, and then we'll tend to the responses because many of them were comments. Ricky Dikul, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. When I talk about Kilo again, I'll certainly not to try to defend anything on the basis of the evil that men do lives after them. I'll simply comment on what the Chairperson made reference to with respect to electricity supply and the privatization. Contextually, in 2007, the Electricity Supply Act was amended in order to enable independent power supply or producers. So that, that route is open. In other words, 
It's not a question of, of government monopolizing the electricity supply. The context is that ESCOM was going to reduce some, I believe, 100 or more megawatts at a given time. My former permanent secretary is here, can tell the details about when that was going to end. And therefore, there was great pressure in order to develop Murupule B, because otherwise we are going to lose that, that kind of margin, possibly certainly more than 100, 100 megawatts, as I said. And therefore, there was that pressure. And other activities that were undertaken in order to attempt to avoid the, the difficulties. So really, that is the context in which we must understand the situation that we ultimately found ourselves. And then, of course, for Murupule, the 300 megawatts, I think the minister did explain yesterday that there is currently an expression of interest for the 300 megawatts around Murupule itself, the brownfield as opposed to greenfield around Mamabula, again, an independent power supply possibility. So I just thought I should explain that particular aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Rod, any comments? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, specifically in response to Maria's question, I, I think it's very important, you know, and, and what Sheila said is true. You know, we, we have COP coming up, or beginning even, and uh, so this question of uh, diversification can't simply be a diversification from diamonds into other exhaustible and finite resources. Uh, but you can't ignore the fact that these resources are abundant and in the ground. So you have to think about how best to harness them given the constraints and potential negative externalities and so on. And, th and this is why we, you know, we think that adding value to them locally would probably be a better bet than exporting them en masse. Um, you know, in raw form. Uh, one also hopes that the revenue generated through that and through diamonds, while diamond revenues are still available, would actually uh, cohere with, with real diversification away from finite resource dependence. And so here yeah, your, your, your options, frankly, are, I think, quite limited. But uh, talking about energy mix and uh, climate change mitigation, solar power, I mean, you know, you guys live here, it's a, it's a sunny place. You know, uh, and so I think that you, you want to create incentives for innovation, particularly in that direction. Uh, one of the difficulties that hasn't been solved around solar really is uh, storage technology. Uh, and, and again, when we talk about incentives for innovation, I think that has to be something that you look at. So I think that you know, there, there was a presentation yesterday that you know, was very eloquent about what Botswana could do to encourage uh, science and technological advance. I think that needs to be honest, particularly in the direction of solving this question of energy storage technology. If you can store solar power, then you can transmit and export it uh, if, without you know, transmission efficiency losses. Uh, and you, that you can then use solar as base load. And the current massive argument against solar is that it's just not sufficiently uh, economical to supply base load power. Uh, but uh, if Botswana could play a role in getting us there, that would be amazing. Uh, and then you don't have to dig holes in the ground. Do me. Um, is this on? It is on. OK. Um, Response to Maria's question on whether we don't have programs for entrepreneurial development. We do have. We have your CEDARS, your layers. Um, but in Botswana, what I must highlight is most of these programs don't have a portion that's specific to women economic empowerment. Um, there's only one program from the Women Gender Affairs Department, which is up to t about 25,000 US dollars for uh, it's been for a cluster of about five women organizations. Now they've changed it. But that's, that's so far, that's the one dedicated thing. Regarding uh, whether women, you know, why, 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 shouldn't, why can't we cluster, you know, come together and bid for bigger work? As an association, it's what we're, we're geared towards. But on hindsight, you ask yourself, do men cluster, you know? Um, no, like a man, you know, eventually, as much as we'd want to cluster, it would be an initial thing, but we want to encourage 
our members to be in terms of individual, you know, be able to grow and thrive as individual organizations. But as starters, we are starting actually a program on construction, on women in construction, that will be clustering mm -hmm. that because we realize that that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. Level. Thank you for the um, comments. And I hope they've as answered most of the questions. I need, I can't. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for the correction. And uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Letter. Um, I would like just to respond to the, the issue of participation of citizens in the economy, in, in particular um, in the um, beneficiation program. There are two major problems. One of them is obviously a training to ensure skills transfer. Um, a lot of talk about um, unskilled labor in Botswana is it's true, but it shouldn't be as if it can't be resolved because we have people, we, we do have highly educated people roaming streets in Botswana who are trainable. I think it's about trainability as opposed to whether we have skilled manpower. The other one is, um, yes, we can talk about um, diversification, talk about um, um, beneficiation, but often the difference between beneficiation and um, corporate, um, your, 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 your corporate, um, what do you call social it? Social responsibility. So, corporate social responsibility are almost identical. Until and unless um, we create vehicles which could be underwritten by government to ensure that there's equity finance. Um, any form of uh, so-called uh, beneficiation is only a pipe dream. Um, you need to ensure that the locals can participate in the uh, creation of vehicles that would ensure uh, funding of equity. I start to that. And unless locals are participating, I do not believe that uh, any form of uh, beneficiation is sustainable. Because the end result is you have a lot of Africans, and this is an African problem by and large, participating in these so-called beneficiation schemes. In the long term, they become fronts. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. We've actually overshot by five minutes. So I, I fear that we have to close. I realize that uh, your question wasn't answered, say. Uh, because it is an important question, I'm going to take poetic license and, and, and take a shot at it. I mean, a couple of things. It is true that there's always room to, to improve, notwithstanding the achievements of uh, Debswana, the Botswana government, and DBS. Uh, I don't agree with you at all that these entities, or the Botswana government for that matter, has not trained people in skills. I mean, I think the records speak for themselves. And Balitsi shared a lot of them with us yesterday. It is, however, very true that you know a lot about the diamond industry, and you do, because you yourself are a product of BDVC, as I am a product of Anglo-American. So I think you do yourself injustice in suggesting that these entities have not trained when you yourself are a perfect example of that. I think the real question is, now that we know that you and I, we have all this knowledge, and, and I think we owe it to ourselves. Because we have this knowledge, we are the Generation X. We are now selfing ourselves, as Stephen was saying. What are we going to do? Can we really legitimately continue to ask Debswana to do for us? Can we really legitimately continue to ask the state to do for us? Or has the time come for the state now to be asking us uh, to do for those who are uh, will come after us. With those few words, can we give a round of applause, please, to the... Uh, thank you.